to be loud enough. Amplify stuff. But are we glad to be here? Amen. Amen. We want to go over and pray. We're going to give you a few announcements first. Well, this Wednesday night, Anybody still can? Uh, some drinks we can use, some uh, single pack chips and all that, a little, I guess, all those kind of snack cakes, snack cakes, stuff like that. You get a can and we'll be here. We'll have to make that and we should talk about that some more. And we'll announce it. Uh, we here and uh, we're going to take a few prayer requests to keep that. We'll start out with you and put it up that prayer request. Uh, Don Lashner is on the board. Please keep praying for her. She's still in the midst of being in this pitch. Another prayer request. Mary Gordon. That's what I have. She's going to be head and surgery. Surgery, so please remember he's uh, blood Oh, 
Um, Um, Mr. Alford and Bernice and them. Um, and Mr. Alford. Yeah. Bubba Pa and Mimi and uh, Unspoken. Bubba Pa and Mimi and Unspoken. Also, uh, Grant Stewart, who's been four surgeries in that thing, for infection, started with two.
missionary, remember a hospital, pray for our first responder, remember those jails and the prisons, pray for them there and in there, pray for our nation as a whole. Mm -hmm. And toward that nation, pray for those that are in authority. And that's according to the word of God. Pray for our military and their family. Remember Israel and pray for Israel. Remember the people in Afghanistan and Ukraine and Haiti, all these taking place there. And we want to give thanks to God and mercy. Uh, and just praying that you can be on our nation. salvation for a place to be together. Thank you, Father, for all your blessings in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.
bird, y'all. <laughs> it, this mic don't work too well sometimes when you get this live. In. So if it sounds bad, let me know. We'll turn it off and I'll follow that. Yeah. So uh, in that way, we ain't getting too distracted by it. So. Well, how is everybody this morning? Yeah, okay. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Right on. Well, I'll go ahead and tell y'all, a few of us got to go yesterday afternoon and, and, and watch the movie Disciples in the Moonlight. I won't go ahead and tell you you have a chance to go see this movie. And, uh, uh, well, I might get back to it more. I might save it for later. But go see the movie if you have an opportunity. If you're a Christian, you really need to see this movie. Uh, I'll just I'll say that. It, I'm not saying a movie's going to get you to heaven or not. I'm going to say this is a movie that's going to let you think a little bit more about the goodness of God and yeah. our nation. <laughs> but I want to jump right on into what i got for us today. And... Uh, <clears throat> I'll play this a time, you know, from time to time here, and usually on a Wednesday night or something like that, but I play it pretty often at the house and, and watch it. But Brother S.M. Lockridge, the old preacher man that he passed on, I, I believe, in the 90s, right around 2000, somewhere along the area, he preached out in San Diego, California, in a big church. And uh, uh, he was a man, I just to give you a little bit uh, on him, he was a fellow from West Texas that was said that, that they believed he was a talk. Said he wasn't ever about enough, uh, you know, as far as you know, being able to be educated or anything like that. Well, let me tell you what, Brother S. M. Lockridge, which he showed him up, he learned quite a bit of man's science and information as well. But he sure knew what was in this. Yeah. And he he was pretty good. But one time he proclaimed, and I and he did some then that little video I like to watch. But in one of the lines there, he says, His mercy is everlasting. Among many other grand descriptors of God. And he was doing all this while he confessed, I wish I could describe it to you. And if you listen to it, you'll say, Well, you're doing a pretty good job. But the thing is, is he understood just as I do that, that the English language in our minds and our tongues cannot explain. Because he even says that in there, he says, let alone a man explain them. And you got to listen to it. If you've not listened to it, if you want to, I'll be glad to play it sometime. It's it just it's, it's about seven minutes long of just snips from six different sermons of his, most from one sermon, but it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing to listen to him. The description of God, but I, I, I keyed this time on this thing of his mercy is everlasting. And and I want to read to us right off the bat here out of the book of Psalms, which I, I believe he may have may have gotten this, this thought from, although the, God's mercy is spoken about throughout the Word of God. But this one right here in Psalms 103, verse 17, it tells us this, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him. As Christians. And His righteousness unto children's children. You see, for the Christian, God's mercy is unmeasurable. That's what that's what it means when he says everlasting to everlasting. When, when he says God's mercy is everlasting, that means it didn't have a beginning. It don't have no end. It does not run out. It has no bounds. The end of that verse right there. That it extends unto my children and my grandchildren. That's what it says right there. God's righteousness and mercy extends not only to me, but to my children and my grandchildren. So in other words, it just keeps on going. And that's the mercy of God. There is no end to it. There's no beginning. There's no end. But now you say there's a, I guess you could say there's a beginning. In this case, it's, there is a beginning when I'm saved. But his mercy was already there. And a lot of times he has mercy on folks that he's got work for you to do. And he keeps on being patient and merciful to us until we finally wake up and we you know, heed the call that he's got on our life. That's mercy too. But remember, <coughs> I, want you, well, I want you to remember this verse as we proceed through the rest of the sermon. Now keep this kind of in your mind there. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness under children's children. Because I want to go now into something uh, that I, I actually preached on this feller, uh, or this the story of this feller uh, several years ago. Uh, matter of fact, it was back when I was first starting to preaching here. 
some of you may remember it. Uh, some of you may not. I even used a book to go along with it to help me out with it a little bit. But it, but it's on a man named John Harper, a pastor named John Harper. Some of you may recognize the name. Uh, I doubt it. Most do. Matter of fact, most people won't recognize the name even if they recognize what he's done. Once we talk about him a little bit. But he was known as the Titanic's last hero. And there's something about mercy that goes along with this. And I just, I've been studying on this verse here for the last few weeks. It's just been on my heart. And I've been, I've been studying a little bit and everything. And I finally kind of went this way uh, with it for his first sermon. And, and I want to tell you a little bit about John Harper's story as we, as, as we progress today. And I want to remind you that that sermon I preached on before was really about John Harper and who he was and what he done and everything. And there was a couple of verses that I want to read to us that help describe who John Harper was uh, as a pastor, but more importantly as a Christian. And in the book of Luke, chapter 14, verse 23, it says this, And the Lord, as Jesus talked and said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. This was important to John Harper because he would go anywhere and everywhere to tell people that Jesus Christ was the same. It was important to him. And that was so, so now you know a little bit about him there. I want to go right up to the next gospel, the gospel of John. I'm going to read to you verses 10, or from chapter 15, verses 12 and 13. And it says this, Jesus again is talking, This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now I read those verses there to give you a little insight on who John Harper is. And like I said on the, when I preached on that sermon years ago, uh, those verses were in there because they, were, they described John Harper as a Christian quite, quite well. So you know right now those little things about John Harper. And he fully believed in these words that Jesus spoke at one time that's recorded in our, our Bibles. And his life and his death gave witness to his belief. So we're going to, I want to discuss just a little bit about him and tell you a little bit about him before we move along into this. But John Harper was a, was a preacher. He was from Scotland. He was at the time of his demise would have been, had been pastoring in London. So all the great Britain were there. He carried it very well. There's part of God. Say the whole country. He had come over and been invited to, to come and preach in Chicago at one time at, at the Moody uh, uh, Memorial Church, uh, or the old Moody Church, old church. And he had come, he had preached there, and he went back home, and they had wanted, wanted to come back and preach. And they wanted him to come for three months and preach there. So he, he agreed to it, and, and he took up passage on what would be the Lusitania. So you don't know the name of that, that ship. It was the sister ship to the uh, Titanic. It was also supposed to be out of, the, out of production before Titanic, but Titanic got there faster. Mm -hmm. well, see, he was supposed to be on the Lusitania, but because there was an opportunity to get there a little bit sooner and preach a little bit more, he swapped over and onto the Titanic. So here he goes, and he... He sets out, and, and the, the witness of him is that he, every day he was preaching on the day. He was, he was witness, he was doing those things, and, and all, and that's what he done. Well, then it comes to that, as we all know what happened to the Titanic. It hits iceberg, and it begins to sink, you know, that unsinkable ship. But we're not going to get into that. We're going to get into the fact, we're going to kind of pick up right there, where John Harper is going around on the decks of this ship, and right off the bat, when they tell him the man the lifeboat, he gives his and here, you know, they're saying, take care of the women, the children, and yourselves. That was the order of the captain when he shipped. The women, the children, and yourself. John Harper immediately went all over that ship saying, take care of the women, the children, and the unsaved. The burden of his heart. So no man, woman, boy, or child will leave this earth and not know that Jesus Christ. First man, I, I, from what I understand, the first man that he walked up on that he asked, do you know Jesus as his Savior, that told him no, he took his life best off and gave it to him and said, do you need this? And he gave it to him and he continued on. And as the ship went down, 
And when I leave in a life vest, in waters that were freezing cold with ice all floating around, let me tell you, it's way colder than springs. You think the springs is cold, and the springs feel like a hot spring compared to what that water felt like with these people went into. And they go in and they sit, and there's witnesses that all told about this. He swam around in the dark in that cold water, and he was asking everybody, did he know Jesus as a Savior? And when they answer no, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And he just they said he swam, just swam around to anybody that could hear. And one man in particular that was a witness that was at a, at, at a meeting later on, <clears throat> a survivor's meeting, said that he swam up to him. He asked him the question. He said, no, I don't know him. And he told him, once again, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And he swam on and kept on. And somehow he managed to come right back by this same guy. And the guy says he asked him again, and he told him again, no, I don't. And he told him again, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And he said, that was the last word you ever wrote. And he said, but when he got that out that time, he said he watched him. He said, don't you walk and that was the end of John Hart. That man would go on to be, to be rescued, to survive, and he would testify to folks that that man is the reason I'm saved. And let everybody know that's the last hero on the Titanic. There wasn't anybody else doing anything else. It was John Hart. Preaching the word of God. Now, some people already would say, well, what's merciful? <laughs> Die a death like that. That don't seem very merciful. We'll get back to that. I want to tell you a little part I left out on that story. He was accompanied by a six year old daughter. That six year old daughter, well, her mother had died before he was birthed. So it was just and the first thing that he done once they said the man the life was, was he took that dog with him, put her in charge of one of the men that was in charge of the life that he was there. He gave her to him so she might be able to be in the life boat. And he, he then went about his business of preaching. You see, he knew that he was probably the Lord. Daughter. His wife was dead already. And now there wouldn't be much chance of him living, but that's what he does. And now, I'd say a lot of us go, where is mercy in that? We, question, we ask those questions, don't we? And we do each and every one of us who had a time to ask for some mercy of God. And I can say in that right there, it's kind of hard to find the mercy. But I want to give you a little bit more. On, uh, on this story here about John Harper and about the mercy of God. And even though we're right now thinking, well, that's not very merciful, maybe we'll see a little bit more. And I will read to you a little excerpt from the book. It's over here towards the back of it. And the way this book reads, it's a good little book. And the story of John Harper is just in the very beginning of it. All the rest of it is testimonies about his life and things like that. But in this, here back in uh, chapter 13, we have John Harper's parting text attributed by Pastor William Wright. And I'm not going to read all of it to you. I just want to read to you the end of it, the parting words from John Harper. My parting with him near the station at Old Cumnock last March was an incident worth remembering. We agreed to give each other a text about it. I gave him the one feed the lamb, and I think we all know that. He was talking to him. Which led him to make this noteworthy statement. Don't you listen to what he, what he said? <clears throat> John Harper had let this pastor know when he was in Chicago, he was earnestly engaged in secret prayer, or in other words, in that prayer that's not here in the church in front of everybody, but rather in your little prayer closet or in that place that you get to pray just between you and the Lord. When he was engaged earnestly in secret prayer, when God, by his Holy Spirit, gave the assurance to him that his little daughter, six years of age, was a Christian. I thank God and 
him most sincerely for the beautiful story, and all the more because I am convinced that this is where many are up against the will of God today and not recognizing the leading children as the land of the flock. Now, I want to read one, one more time to you right there. When he was in Chicago, he was earnestly engaged in secret prayer when God, by his Holy Spirit, gave the assurance to him that his little daughter was a Christian. I want to tell you something. That gave John Harper hope. Yes. I'm going to read the verse to you real quick. Over in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, we have a hope. And John Harper had a hope, a living hope. You know what that is, a living hope? We don't have to be scared of death and dying in the grave because we have a living hope in the Lord Jesus Christ by what he's done for us that when we leave here, as Sister Spread Wildhead would say, we'll step over a broomstick and be in the presence of God in, in the life that we really are part of, that what is our real life. In that moment, we'll get to it. John Harper had a living hope. He knew that he trusted God, and God had given him that, that opportunity to, to know that his, that his little girl knew Jesus. He knew, John Harper knew, despite whatever that little girl might live through in this world, and the, the tar trials and the turmoils and the tribulation, and we all know that back in that time, being an orphan wasn't exactly a good thing. It's not a good thing now, but it sure wasn't back then. And he knew that he had peace enough to place her into the hands of that, that man that would take care of him so that he might go about his work for the Lord. And he knew that he knew his daughter would miss out on that righteous judgment of God. And in that knowledge, he could, with all peace, and that's that peace that passes on our understanding, and let me tell you something about that peace. You've got to be saved to know what I'm talking about. Right? Yeah. That's a, that, that peace is not available to the unsaved. So if you're asking yourself, well, what peace is he talking about? You know, he'll give it to you, I promise you. And because of that, that peace, he was able to place his daughter in that life. Though. Knowing full well that that was probably going to make her an orphan. Because he knew that she would be taken to be taken care of better than he could be there. The Lord had already promised him. She was a Christian. He had that, he had that, and folks say, well, you can't know. Well, we can't know. But when the Holy Spirit speaks to something, he listens to it. That was a peace that, that was a peace that he was going to need before he made it to the place that God had him in And he gave him that peace. And he knew that he could trust in the Lord. And I want to read to the last little bit of that, that part and part right there. I'm going to carry on with that just a little bit there. But the next little, little line says, The text he gave me was one that had been much in his mind for a considerable time. Remember, they swapped texts. The text he gave him was 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. And it says this, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You see, he knew because he understood salvation of his daughter of himself, and he had been assured of the salvation of his daughter through the through the Holy Spirit. He understood that they both, him and his daughter and his wife, were all still they can live forever, have an everlasting life in the presence of God, he had that assurance. And so you see, God had given him that assurance that his daughter was in fact a Christian and, would, and knew God and knew him and gave him that peace that passed all understanding to prepare him for the work that he had to do and the work that he already could go about because he knew his daughter was okay and he knew that he could go off living despite what might happen to this old woman. He was assured of that. 
He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Whether in this world or in the next. You see, there's mercy in the knowledge of the salvation of our children and those others that we so tenderly love and leave them behind in this world. You know, that weighs on our hearts, I think, sometimes, especially as we get older, about our kids, our children, our grandchildren. Are they going to be all right? And are they, you know, this, that, and other, no, that. I've got to stay here. I've got to be here because I'm the one that's got to take care of. No, God is going to take care of Let's make that promise. And when we come to know that, we can have a little peace about that. Just as John Harper did. He showed great mercy. Mercy like Brother S. M. Lockers tried to explain. He showed that mercy to, to John Harper and allowed him to preach the word. And focus on preaching the word, the gospel, the gospel message that many desperately needed. What was it? Some 1,700 people, I think, that perished that night in the town of the all 1,700, well, I don't know if they were saved or unsaved, but the ones that were unsaved needed John Harper. And they needed what he was preaching and giving to them. And God had been merciful to John Harper in the knowledge of, and understanding that his daughter was taken care of already. And that so was he. And that was the mercy that God showed him in this tragedy. That what we would view as the world was as nothing but a tragic, awful thing for both John Harper and the world all the time. But there was mercy. There was grace. And if you want a little consoling word on, on Nana, let me tell you what happened to her. She was rescued. Her life made it. They rescued her. And she made it back to Scotland. And if I can remember <coughs> she was raised by family. So she didn't grow up at all that time, which was pretty bad. You know what? She grew up. She paid the ministry. And she devoted her. She devoted her entire life to the Lord her father himself. So that's where she did. I mean, people lose somebody and they blame God. They get mad at God. They don't see the mercy. We all do it. God's mercy is everlasting. He is everlasting. From the beginning, it, it, it was from before me and it'll go till after me. His mercy is everlasting. Now I'm going to tell you, and this is where I said I want to go back to what we went through and watched a little bit. Of, and I don't want to spoil it for anybody that wants to go watch the movie. But it was a very real movie. It was very well done. It was. Uh, he gave you the what if, and I'll give you this because you get this from the trailer and you can watch it. The Word of God here. I preached a little sermon on this a while back. The Word of God, although uh, the Holy Bible as we know it, had been bad. Here in this United States, it's been bad. It's been replaced with a all-inclusive, all-love uh, replacement that the government has sanctioned. They even read in there, John 3.16, this has been rewritten, and I'm not going to go into that, because uh, I want to ask part of the movie for you to see. You can see it. But in other words, there were churches that didn't even have the word of God in the Bible. It's been banned. They've been hunted down and burned and destroyed. And, and you say, where's the mercy? First of all, we're most of us learn this. Because the truth is, is most of us don't concern ourselves enough with praying and studying and witnessing in order to be shown that mercy, to be able to continue to freely have this Word of God and freely assemble like we do. And that's what he was making a point of as well. And but yet there were some people in this movement that we're willing to sacrifice in order to give this. And again, I don't want to get too much away. But there's one moment in there that I'm going to have, I'm going to, have to say this because it goes along with this, this thing that we've got here, the mercy of God. Where one of these disciples getting these Bibles out, uh, he, he'll die. I, I'll, I'll spoil it for you. There's some people who die in this room. And this guy dies, but not only does he die, he dies right in front of his, I think it's 
about a 12 year old kid. His son dies right in his face. It's he sees it. He sees that his baby dies because he's trying to get the word of God to people that don't have it. You say, Where's the mercy? And even though this is a movie I'm talking about, folks, this happens in our world. Oh, yeah. It's happening all over in our world. And let me tell you what, it's at our doorsteps in this country. The mercy of that in the, in the movie, just it's what we just talked about with John Harper, that young man would go on after being back for a little while. Like, 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 he would go on and become a disciple. Out there spreading the word of God, just like he did. So they, they, they let you know that the cause of his daily sacrifice, him seeing his daily sacrifice, and led him trust in the merciful God. And you say, well, where's the mercy there? Even still, now the kid's on the run and his daddy's dead and all of this stuff. He showed the mercy because he's letting the word of God still be the people. John Harper, the last person to witness to. God is real merciful to that. Well, that man didn't know God. He didn't know Jesus as his Savior. And the last words that come out of John Harper's mouth led him to become to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. That was great mercy on that. God's mercy to know you. You'll look. If you'll look at any situation in your life through the lens of the Word of God, I promise you, it's about the mercy of God. And if you can, I encourage you to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's about it. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day that you've given us. We thank you for the wonderful opportunity to come into your house. Without fear, Somebody's going to kick down that door and arrest us, separate us, and do things to our, our wives and our children. And God, we don't have to deal with that. Your mercy is bounding us on us. I pray that we can see your mercy in everything that goes on in our lives. Even when it don't seem like there's any mercy, Father. Even when the world would say there is no mercy whatsoever. God, let us see that mercy. Let us look. Lord, mercy in everything that happens, Lord, through prayer and through this word that we so freely still hold. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you for your willingness to send us a Savior. I pray, Father, there's no one in here that don't know you. And if there is God, soften their hearts. Speak to them today. God, show their need for a Savior and let them see how merciful you are. Oh God, I ask that you would go with us as we leave here today. Bless us. If you give us this week, Father, bless us with a good time and vacation life. Lord, let your mercy abound and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Well, remember, we got a meeting. Right now, right now, we're going to be involved in the